In 19, uh, Professor Raghuram has been traveling all around the globe, hundreds uh, of teachers and motivating thousands of lives. Uh, so he has uh, trained more than 300 yoga teachers in uh, Turkey, and uh, they have also been initiated into uh, mantra and meditation. Uh, he has conducted. Uh, uh, he had uh, conducted hundreds of uh, yoga teacher training courses, uh, thousands of corporate stress management workshops, and uh, yoga therapy workshops in India, uh, in a neurological clinic, clinic in Germany, and Memorial Heart Hospital in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, and also in uh, MD Anderson uh, uh, Cancer Center in uh, Houston. Uh, yeah, he's uh, also organized international conferences in the USA and uh, one for value-based education in Bangalore. Uh, he has been honored with uh, the awards uh, Yoga Shri and Vivekanand Vibhuti. Uh, and he was a member in the delegation of, for a UN conference in Uruguay in 2000 on education and was a delegate representing India in who at uh, Geneva, Switzerland under the leadership of then Health Minister 2005. Uh, he has been uh, the chief guest in San Francisco, California at International Day of Yoga celebrations and uh, uh, keynote speakers at various conferences uh, in, uh, in, in Sri Aurobindo Society in New Delhi and uh, Center for Spiritual Enlightenment in California. So I'll welcome uh, Professor Raghuram and uh, ask him to. Yoga and spirituality, they are not two separate subjects actually, yoga and spirituality, they are one and the same. But unfortunately over a period of time, people divorced it so much that we have to specially say yoga and spirituality like that. Otherwise, the whole text of yoga, Bhagavad Gita, is also Upanishad Vidya, Brahma Vidya, it's a spiritual knowledge, supposed to. <clears throat> and the practice is Yoga Shastra, right? the science of yoga. But it was supposed to be the spiritual content that was there. And particularly our culture was supposed to be something which has enriched with the spirituality. In fact, uh, spiritual values, ideas, I'll come to what is that spirituality later on. But then, basically, that was a kind of a content of this particular culture itself. Vivekananda, when he came to the Parliament of World Religions, he addressed beginning, said that from the oldest of the cultures, I brought, his, I brought this message to the youngest of the nations. And then immediately, the press people caught up that idea, saying that, why do you say that it is oldest of the cultures? He said, like, there are several old cultures, ancient cultures, which have gone into the history books. They don't exist like Mesopotamian, Babylonian. All these cultures are not there. In fact, recently in front of our eyes, Greek has gone into the history books like that. Whereas this is a culture which is 10,000 years old, but still surviving, vibrantly surviving. And that's why it is. Then they ask, what is that? Because with this culture survived for several thousands of years, 10,000 years. He said, every culture has a narrow character. It's a very beautiful way we make on that, okay? Every culture has a narrow character. And that identifies the culture. When you look at it, today also you can see that Germany, the narrow character is supposed to be sturdiness. That's why their cars are sturdy. You look at BMW or you look at all those things. And then the roads, so sturdy. No speed limit. Okay. If you take Indian car, there it flies. Whereas, look at Japan. The narrow current of Japan is supposed to be the miniature. America has big roads, Japan has small roads. But then equally efficient. Big cars, they small cars. 
India has a huge mango tree, they have a bonsai mango tree, but equally efficient. That's what is their nerve current. England the nerve current is regality. Everything is in the name of queen. Look at the way recently that wedding was there. It was like a state function. Very well. And people respect it. That's what is the way it is. America, the nerve current is in business. Look at every other country, you know, you go to Germany, you go to Italy, you go to France and all that. <clears throat> You can see the skyline, the spikes of church or something like that. Whereas you come to America, the skyline of every city is nothing but two tall buildings, either insulin building or the, or the bank buildings. And you know, very interesting thing is these two industries do not make money. They play with your money. Okay. But anyway, that's what is American culture. That's a, in India, we have several thousand. Thousands of years this yoga is there, but we never heard yoga to be as a business. Whereas when it came to America, now when I come to America, people say, wow, you know, yoga, four billion dollar business. Wow. <laughs> I don't know in what way I'm benefited by that. But anyway, this is the language that they speak. I introduced in Houston a simple native pot. You know, it's a small plastic for the water through the nose so that it can take care of your allergy and hardly you know 15 rupees 20 rupees now it's about 50 rupees and then i introduced here i see in five years they have come out with a nice wonderful beautiful pack and that's called as and they are very good at giving names <laughs> nasal irrigation equipment 50 dollar a piece and then in high bold letter they write, a sachet of salt is free. <laughs> wow. And then people go for that. Now nobody wants my lady pot. So that's what. Similarly, is that when you look at them, India, the narrow current of India is spirituality. <coughs> Just survived for several thousands of years. In fact, when 1857 war, and that was the time that we had almost lost the war. I mean, we lost the war because of some small little thing. And afterwards, the war was so important for Britain because after that 1857 war, Britain made the whole change of the whole system. And instead of East India Company managing India, <laughs> the British government involved, they sent the viceroy and all that. You can imagine. What must have been the impact of that war? And at that time, Mekale has sent a report about India to America, I mean to British government, and then there he said that this is one really strange country where the houses are not locked, you don't have any restaurants or hotels and all that. Everybody is taking care of everybody. Food is food is plentiful, and then you can't influence this culture. It is such an extraordinary, wonderful culture because. The essential factor of this culture is supposed to be spiritual values. That means to say, serve the poor, give to the needy. These were the things which are very common to this particular culture. And he writes, unless until we break this from this culture, you cannot conquer their minds. You know, you can just remain the best. You, however long you rule, the country is continuing to be like that. So that means to say, even British recognize that this was a narrow current of India, that's what the culture. This is what Vivekananda said in 1857 that was happened, and 1893 at the Parliament of World Religion, Vivekananda said about this particular thing. And after that, systematically it is eroded to a level there. Today it has become so difficult. But otherwise, just if anybody in the world is supposed to give this spiritual value, it must be our country, India. And particularly, in the name of yoga and spirituality, it's very important today because International Day of Yoga, by that way, it has now become yoga is a tool all over the world. In fact, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, that when I was going around, I had to tell people that there is something like called as yoga. That is today, I don't have to tell it. All over the world, people know about yoga. In fact, many countries where they do not know where India is, and then yoga comes from India, yoga is spread. 
like I went to a small little place, country called as Cyprus. And Cyprus, a small place called Nicosia, from there you drive for about 200 miles, a small little village called Girne. And I was sitting there in a coffee shop. Somebody came to know that I come from Yoga University. And then they said, can you come and give a talk to us? And then there were about 40 people attending yoga there in that small little country. Similarly, like that in a small place like Uruguay, when I went there, I was just going for a walk in Ponte Dalasta and suddenly found two yoga centers there. I just kept, walked in there and said, did you know this, you have yoga centers, I'm very happy about that, yeah. Then said, where are you coming from? I come from India. Then I asked him, do you know where yoga comes from? He said, they don't know. But then they have Bhagavad Gita there, they have yoga, and then Natraja picture is there and everything is there. So that means they did not even hear the name called country India, but then yoga is there. So yoga spread all over the world. Actually, this is something which is cutting across all the creed, caste, religion, culture, everything. Yoga has spread. But then, when earlier our sages are given in the Upanishad, there is a reference about yoga. That means Upanishad is supposed to be Brahma Vidya, supposed to be the ultimate spiritual knowledge. And then there itself that we have a definition of yoga. Tam yoga viti manyante sthiram indriya dharanam. One of the Upanishad gives the definition. And then later on Bhagavad Gita, every chapter is a yoga. Arjuna Vishya Deva, Karma Yoga, Nama Yoga, Parth Yoga, you can see all kinds of yoga that is there. And then at the end of every chapter, we say, Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita su Upanishad su Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri. Upanishad Vidya, Brahma Vidya, Yoga Shastra. They are come together. And this yoga, when it went to East, that means Buddhism has taken this yoga practices, they took these practices as a prana practices. And prana, in Prakrit, it is called as chi, chi ya ki. So the same yoga practices went to the East, went to Afghanistan from there, it went to China, to Japan and all that, Indonesia, Malaysia and all that. There it went as chi practices, Tai Chi, Falun Chi, Reiki and all those things. But only when these practices, when it went to the West, it's about 300 years ago that Europeans have taken this yoga in the West from India. You know, they are study people, as I said, Germans. So they have taken this yoga as a physical exercise. And that same thing came to USA also, more like a physical exercise. That's why they have clubbed this yoga with all the physical exercise. Yoga Pilates, Yoga Karate, Yoga blah, 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 all these kind of things. Um, all things for the physical, you know, maintain the good physical yoga, yoga for sex, yoga for this. Now these days, anywhere to anywhere, beer yoga is also there in this country. So this is how basically you guys become grounded into physical. Now, at this point of time, I have to specially say yoga for spirituality. You know, it becomes like something which is specially on that people. But originally, it was like that. Now, especially, another important idea today, what is the need for the spiritual value, spiritual journey is, in 1970s itself, World Health Organization wanted to change the definition of health from the perspective of focusing on the sickness to health. That's why, they have given the definition, health is not absence of sickness, it's not a mere absence of sickness, it's a positive well-being at the physical, mental, social, spiritual level like that. They have given a long definition about health. This is what 1970s that World Health Organization thought about it. The idea is, let us not focus on the sickness. It's not only not sickness, not absence of sickness, it's a positive well-being at the physical, mental, social, spiritual level. <clears throat> and it is a reality also. Not that they have something which is not real that given. It's a reality. Like we all have, if you look at it, the health that we look at, your health, it's so much positive well-being that is there. Like for example, at this point of time, if some accident is there, somebody needs a, a half a liter of blood, you can just give it away. Right away, you can go and give half a liter of blood. Nothing will happen to you. That means to say that half a liter of blood is positive well-being that's there within you. Similarly, from an accident and then some nerve is cut, immediately they can pinch some other nerve somewhere and put it there. That means it's there in the store somewhere. 
you can put it there and repair it. We have that. Similarly, we have two kidneys, 50% is excess. That means one kidney you can donate to somebody, you can still survive comfortably. That can also capture. That means how much of positive well being that we have. And your heart functions only half of the area, 50% of the heart will function. Lungs, if you take only two thirds of the lung functions that is there, one third extra bonus given to you. So much we have given. In fact, so much of fat that is given our system, any of us, even if we do not eat for the next one week food, we can still survive. That means so much of positive well being that is there. But how many do you really feel it? Now ask anybody, how are you? Ah, uh, managing. <laughs> I mean, you don't even feel that positive well being. Can you say that? Yeah, I'm so wonderful. I'm extraordinary. But that feeling is not there. Somehow we don't have that positive well being. This is what World Health Organization wanted us to have focus on the positive well being, not on the sickness. But unfortunately, they have given such a lofty definition. But when the management of health came, they are at very first step. That means to say, if you have sickness, then they have a management of health. Otherwise, they don't, they can't manage. Like, for example, at the best of the physicians or the doctors that you have a friend of yours, and then you go to him and he will ask you, So, how are you doing? And if they say, I'm fine, immediately he will say, Why are you wasting your time and my time? If you have some sickness, then you come to me. Otherwise, why do you come to me? So you should have some sickness to go to him. Otherwise, he has no business with you. That means to say he has business with your sickness. Yeah, we can understand that. If you have antibodies, they have antibiotic. If you have acid, they have antacid. See, something to do with the sickness, not with you. A friend brought his uncle to Mullah Nasruddin and said, my uncle has diarrhea. Mullah said, I have a wonderful medicine. Give this medicine three times a day for two days. Diarrhea will stop. And then he took that medicine, went away. Mullah met his friend a month later in the market and asked, how is your uncle? <coughs> Mullah friend said, my uncle is no more. Mullah asked, it doesn't matter, will diarrhea stop or not? <laughs> I have given the medicine for his diarrhea. See, this is what the medicine is for the sickness, not for the health. World Health Organization has given a definition of health like that, but then when it came to the management of health, it's not my words. It is American National Health Journal. They quoted this. We are managing only the sickness, not health. We have to do something with the health. And there is no system on this earth where directly it addresses the health. Only thing that it addresses health is our Indian medical system called as Ayurveda. In fact, the very word means Ayu means health, Veda means knowledge. And if you look at Charaka Samhita Sushruta, you see that all that what you read is like the way that you are reading some of the spiritual texts. It doesn't look like that you are reading a medical text, but manual, etc., etc., and other these things. So that means basically that we have a system which is directly addressing the health. And when we say addressing the health, it's not just only the health at the physical level, but at the total personality level, which includes spiritual well-being. So when we found out that this is the definition of health, and this is the way that yoga can view that, unfortunately what happened was that this yoga and Ayurveda, the whole Indian culture that is there could catered to that. Unfortunately, what happened was that there was no, uh, you know, in the past so many years that there was no research data to supplement to their claim that these things can be done. In fact, this is what is one of the statements Vivekananda made a hundred years ago when he was in this country. He said that the future of the world depends upon the best of the East should meet with best of the West. And best of the East is supposed to be our Indian philosophy and then yoga and all those things. And best of the West is the scientific spirit. See, today West is on the top because that we have all the scientific research, so much research work that has been done. Whereas back in India, we didn't have that. It was there in the culture, whatever that is there, we knew it. My grandmother knew about it, her grandmother knew about it. So it has come like that. 
In fact, even today also when you go back home, that's what your grandmother will say. Put some haldi, put some this, put some that and everything will go. Yes, it's all right. But did we do the research work? So this was a challenge in front of us when we were youngsters. They said, all right, let us give up my job and then go for this research. Myself and my wife and my brother in <coughs> I'm an engineer. He was a doctor. And my brother-in-law was also a doctor working in NASA here. He gave the job up and then came and we started our research. And then we published our research papers in the Indian journals. Later on, its application and all those things, we started publishing in the international journals. When we started publishing in the international journals, then the world has opened up their eyes. That's where basically they said, if it is something which is supposed to be scientific that way, because orthodox medical journal like British Medical Journal, which does not publish anything which does not belong to pharmacological management, and such a British medical journal published our paper on bronchial asthma. That was like an eye-opener for everybody. And then they said, if it is something which is like a science, it should apply anyway. <clears throat> That's how we started our research work in England. We started research work on diabetes in Royal Free Hospital in London. And then British Medical Journal uh, published a paper on that. And then we did work in the Medisco General Hospital in England. Then America said, okay, why don't we do also here? So through NIH grant, we started our work in the MD Anderson Cancer Research Center. We also did work on the respiratory disorders in Colorado. So like this, when we did it, then it went around the whole world. Not only these things, Orthodox Muslim countries like Turkey, we have started our research work in Turkey in the heart hospital. And this is how we are able to go around particularly in the neurological area that hardly there is any modern medicine that's available. So we enter into Germany and it's supposed to be a very conservative Germany called Bavaria. And then we started our work and then we have regularly our doctors posted there and then they are giving the yoga therapy and research is going on. So this is how we said that we need to bring about this whole idea of these things. Now, there is another challenge that is there in front of us. What happened is that yoga anywhere is spreading. Something or the other in the name of yoga. Some physical exercise, some karate, some pilate, yoga, some somebody from Calcutta, because Calcutta is a hot place, humid place. And then he started a studio which is humid and hot and all that. And he called it as hot yoga because it's so big. <laughs> <laughs> and all those things are going. Anyway, now it is Yoga is spreading, like for example, physical exercise and all this. But if we want to really bring about the change in the world, we have to bring about the yoga as a holistic approach. This is one thing. And second thing is, if it is supposed to be a science, it should not belong to a particular place, a particular person, particular individual, etc. But today what happened? Yoga has become so personalized, individualized, like this is my yoga versus your yoga. And this is this yoga and that's yoga, secret yoga. Only my teacher can only give you. You can't even share this series and videos and DVDs and blah, 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 all those kinds of things. You need to get out of it. <clears throat> in physics or chemistry today, we don't have anything like Christian chemistry or English physics or you know Britain uh, mathematics. Though uh, uh, the uh, you know Einstein and all that, they are from Germany. There is nothing like a German physics etc. like that. So why not we bring this yoga also about that? So these are the three, four challenges with us. One thing is that we try to see that how yoga can be brought about as a science to the world. Second thing is take out all this bracket saying that this is my yoga to your yoga. You know, so unfortunately this country is trained in that way. When we first entered into the the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Research Center, and then they have given us you know, INH, NIH, National Institute, they have given us the form in which what kind of yoga you give. And then they give Ayanar Yoga, Bikram Yoga, Chakram Yoga. I said, you know, we want to get out of this, but then there is no column separately for us. We have to tell them that this is evidence based yoga. Because every bit of it we do is based on evidence. If you do any particular step, we have seen what are all the pathological studies, physiological studies, 
or the psychological studies that are these things that are happening. So this is how we need to bring about all those things. And second thing is, they, this is the second thing. And third aspect we need to bring about is the way that the spiritual content we need to bring about. In fact, every Indian who is coming outside, this is what Modi ji said in his talk in San Francisco last year. He said that everybody coming out of India is an ambassador, ambassador for culture. Whether knowingly, unknowingly, consciously, unconsciously, then you spread this culture and you take this culture. And this culture we need to take. It. When this culture has to be brought forward, who else is the best ambassador than Indian that we need to bring about? So therefore, he brought this idea of yoga because one thing is yoga cuts across all the divisions that are there, whether it is caste or creed or anything like that. Therefore, yoga can be a wonderful binding force. And it can bring about the spiritual value for this particular thing. Therefore, yoga has to bring about that spiritual value. And what is that spiritual content, the spiritual value? That's what he has included in that logo. If you look at that IDY, Indian International Day of Yoga, the logo is peace, harmony and health. These are the three important components that are there, which are supposed to be the spiritual well-being of the human being. At the, in the most level, that's what is the idea. Now, what happened is that, see, how distinctly, how, how Patanjali has given us the whole journey of yoga, spectrum of yoga in the form of Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Dharma, Dhyana, Samadhi. All these five steps, eight steps is called as Ashtangani. These are all the things which are yoga. Out of which last three steps, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi, people called it as meditation. In fact, one bus, when first Vivekananda came to this country, and he was the first person who introduced yoga to this country. You see, he was giving talks on Raj Yoga. When he was giving talks on Raj Yoga, it was burden on him to see that he communicates with, you know, those days it's not the Indians who were here, it's all Americans. He has to communicate to them. So when he started talking about Dharana, he said concentration. Somehow he tried to manage with that. But then when he came to Dhyana, what to say? So he he immediately says that our concentration too. But then he was not very happy with that. Then he changed it to contemplation. Then he came up with the idea of meditation. And then Samadhi called it as absorption. That's okay. This is how the word called meditation has come as a part of Raja Yoga. But unfortunately, what happened? Later on, some sages have come, like for example, Paramus Yogananda has given what is called as Self-Realization Foundation. He started the work of meditation. Then Swami Rama came and he did a study on himself on meditation. And he stopped the breath, he stopped the pulse rate, he stopped the heart for almost like two minutes. It became such a big, just a wow, you know, meditation can stop your heart. So all those things. And then that did not convince people because we don't want to stop our heart. We want heart to be running completely. So that's how. Then immediately after that, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi came. He gave the idea of meditation. With all these things, what happened was, yoga is separate and meditation is separate. Though it is part of the same thing, our interest in meditation, not in yoga, people will say that. Our interest in yoga, not in meditation, don't teach us meditation. A lot of people come, tell Asanas, after the asanas, when we switch over to meditation, they say, okay, I'm busy work tomorrow, I'll do that. Not today. See, that means to say they would like to get away from that. This is how, unfortunately, these things have separated. So, job is to see that how we can bring about all these things, to see, ultimately, we need to have that spiritual growth. And this is there right from the first step in Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So, Yama Niyama are the first two, two steps. After that, asanas will come, pranayama will come. And somehow, what happened is, many of the yoga institutions, they left behind yama nema for you. And then they said, asana pranayama, that's we teach. But yama nema, yeah, you study for yourself. But they have such an extraordinary, wonderful detail that is there. And a lot of high values that are there, moral values that are there. And this is what is ahimsa, satya, steya, brahmacharya, parikraha. We have so many yoga schools are there, but how many yoga schools are really looking at ahimsa as a spiritual value, as an important step of yoga? It's not there. But not only Patanjali gives us the ahimsa, 
ahimsa means non violence he goes so deep into describing about the ahimsa i will not take up many things but then because not stopping but then just simple idea what is the way patanjali wanted us to have this idea of ahimsa it's a very simple thing he said ahimsa is a non violence very right? simple idea that means don't hurt anybody don't hurt anybody reason or no reason don't hurt anybody that's what is the first thing second thing is not only don't hurt anybody physically but also don't hurt by your words because many times people speak so harshly and the other person is crying they say i have not even touched to why are you crying <laughs> by your words you are murdered see that means on the words have you ever watched in your words in fact in ramayana rama's description is urdu bhashana that means to say he never speaks a word which hurts somebody so much that he was a non violence rama only one person who understood that rama's non violence was ravan one day mandodari says to ravan mandodari ravan's wife she says to ravan why do you want to go you know he is supposed to be in charge of you whatever the forum that he would like to have he would go so one day goes like kubera one day goes like that to entice sita sita is never into his tricks Mandodari suggests, why do you go in do so many different forms? You know very well, Sita likes Rama. Why don't you just take the Rama's form and then go there? Sita will be behind you. <laughs> you think that I am mad? Why? He said, even if I contemplate for one minute on Rama, I can only go to Sita and go down in front of her. Please go back to home. This is what I can do. It. That's what is the power of Rama's non-violence. so it's not only in the mind but even in the words in not only in the activity but in the words i was telling this about the non violence in the speech level this something that we can practice speech level we can practice i was telling in the to the children we have a children group in doha and i was telling in that doha in children next day a mother came to me and said you know last night and my daughter you know 9 10 year old daughter went to her brother and then everybody went to sleep i was just curious what she is going there for and then she went to her brother and said you know today raghuram uncle said we should practice non violence in words how many times you would have hurt parents how many times you would have hurt me i would have hurt you at least let us bring about in such a way now onwards i never be tough let's not hurt each other such a big such a big message when does then violence comes in your words when the violence is there in your mind so therefore it's not only karmanaha vacha but even manas you practice non violence wow no violence even in the mind don't think of any violence even. this is what patanjali says let me give you a very beautiful example how one can exist with how deeply one can practice non violence you know during the freedom struggle gandhi ji went to shanti niketan and to meet with uh, tagore there are discussions whole day morning the evening in the evening then both of them wanted to go for a walk because shanti niketan is like a forest wanted to go for a nice wonderful walk and uh, bapuji went to his guest room and then gurudev went to his room and then bapuji got ready in 5 minutes and came out when after all, what is there to get ready anyway how dressed he is so he just just and came up and then waiting for gurudev 5 minutes 10 minutes gurudev did not come out became a little restless and this moved the curtain a little bit to peep inside what is this gurudev doing gurudev is combing his hair you know long hair nicely adjusting his hair and combing it all bapuji looked at him laughed he said wow how long do you take to dress yourself up show you all is 32 feet which anyway not there gurudev said bapuji 
you don't know what is meant by combing hair because Gandhiji never had hair. You don't understand about that. So let me. Uh -huh. Yeah, you have hair, you know. Don't have to brag about it. Now Gandhiji made another remark saying that, you know, at your age, at our age, we are going for a walk. Who do you want to impress? You know, which girl has to follow? Teasingly. Gurudev replied to him, he said, Bapuji, you practice non-violence your way, I practice non-violence like this. Wow. This was like something which Bapuji could not understand. We can Latin for it. And he was somebody who has got the freedom of the country by non-violence. And then in this dialogue, he said, I practice non-violence like this. He said, Gurudev, forgive me, I didn't understand what you said. You know, reply, Gurudev's reply, he said, if I do not dress up properly and walk in the campus, anybody who looks at me feels, is Gurudev not well today? Is he suffering some? They might feel hurt. I don't want to hurt them. This is what is the feeling of hurt that you can practice deep inside non-violence. This is what Patanjali says. If you practice non-violence within you, ahimsayam pratishthayam tatsannidav vairatyakaha. There is no question of why the must be now. Ah. This is what is the practice of yoga. It's not that I stand on my head, I stand in my, twist my body in 10 different contortions. That's not the yoga. All these things have to be practiced in the form of yoga. This is what is the communication that we need to do. As a part of the spiritual culture, we take it to the world. And like this, that there are five yamas, five niyamas, each one of them, when you go to that, you feel that converting all these things into just simple practice of few postures, how much we are disserving yoga, how much we should do the service about yoga. These are the things that we need to take it. And second thing is another very important aspect of spiritual well-being is the most important, the, the last and final step on the Ashtanga Yoga, I mean, and the Panchakosha, you know, human being is like the current yoga philosophy, human being is five different personality level. Our physical body is the grossest level, grossest level, Annamai Kosha, but then deeper than that is the Pranamaya, Manomaya, Jnanamaya, deep inside we are the Anandamaya Kosha. At the physical body level, at the body level, our nature to start with spiritual, and that's what is to be relaxed. Look at the children, they are so relaxed. They always are relaxed. Actually, you know, no child is under tension. Walks relax, runs relax, even falls relax. No tension at all. That's a natural state. And that was our nature when we were children. You know, look at the simple pastime of the child. If you look at it, the simple pastime of the child is anywhere in the world. I went around 60 countries of the world and I see that anyway. You put the child in the lying down position. The simple pastime is take the big toes and put it in the mouth. Every child does that. The whole body becomes like a ball. The joints are relaxed, muscles are relaxed, no tension at all. We were also doing like that. But as we have grown up, now body is tense, joints are tense, muscles are tense so much. And people come for my yoga class and say that do padastasan. I'm not talking about those people who cannot see the toes because of Madhya Pradesh. But then who can see the toes? They say those toes as if it is somebody else's. How can I hold the toes? My hands do not go below the knees because the body is tense. But you are putting the toes in your mouth as a child. What happened to you now? Huh, I can do the social service. I can put the, my toes in somebody else's mouth. <laughs> come away from our nature. Tension is the way we have come away from our nature in the body. Similarly, in the prana level, our nature was to be slow. No child is in a hurry. Mother says to the child, come on, come fast. The child says, yes, I'm walking fast. But in reality, you don't see the child moving. We were also like that. Similarly, at the mind level, Manoma Kosha level, our nature was to be calm. Children are no worry at all. Mother's worry. Child is no worry at all. And we were also like that when we were children. But as we have grown up, worry, worry, worry. 
nothing to worry we sit down and worry am i forgetting something <laughs> i must be worrying something <laughs> usually in our center when our the patients come that they come to me for counseling husband and wife they came to me initially for 10 minutes both of them they talk to me and afterwards wife told husband you go out i want to talk to raghuram personally <laughs> the husband fellow went out our main question was raghuram ji my main worry is my husband doesn't worry <laughs> he doesn't worry that's why you are worried so you pick up worry you worry you worry the rodin's culture that is there you know that's what is human thing is always about worried man at the intellectual they have wrong notions fixation otherwise children do not have any fixation okay anything is okay whereas we have such fixation this is right this is wrong this is okay this is not okay i mean how many such fixation that we have ah fortunate that we didn't have we don't have so many things in india at least at the in, deep inside at the bliss level at the anandamaya level our own nature the harmony is our nature look at the whole creation the whole creation harmony is the essential feature of the creation that was our nature also to start with harmony is not coming from outside look at the nature the roots in the soil of a plant and the flowers and the foliage and the sky they are in such wonderful harmony and the moment that you cut off the roots the flowers will also die the plant will die the orange you take the bitter seed inside and a wonderful sweet fruit they born together grow to the fullness together and the sweet fruit and the bitter seed the fruit will not disturb the seed seed will not disturb the fruit that's what is the health of the orange fruit in fact as a whole that you keep the orange it can stay for 3 4 days but then you separate them out then it can stay for only 3 4 hours see that harmony is the essential feature of the creation children also have such wonderful harmony the harmony between hunger and eating animals have that the forest animal can eat anything but you don't find an obese animal in the forest why Because they eat as much as the hunger permits, or towards the leaves, but the other predators to take it. It doesn't understand. It. Whereas our domesticated animals are, they lost their harmony because we have given them this harmony. A friend of mine in Colorado, that lady, American lady, she has a nice, wonderful farmhouse, and then I went to that farmhouse. I love animals. I went there, and then there was a horse standing there, good looking, and all that. i wanted to feed grass you know so i picked up some green grass wanted to feed she came running from inside she said no no don't feed my horse said what my horse is on diet <laughs> my god <laughs> what a unfortunate thing it is so that means to say we have not only created this harmony within ourselves we have yeah, donated generously to the nature also there is harmony is deep inside our spiritual nature. so when we go back in harmony that's what is the health the harmony between hunger and eating harmony between exertion and sleep harmony between the systolic diastolic harmony between various aspects of it this is what is our nature if we have that harmony within us that same harmony we can translate into the world outside today look at the way in the name of this is what swami vivekananda said in the name of spirituality in the name of religion more wars are fought in the name of religion than any other reason and that means basically there's so much of disharmony created in the world fighting fighting why because you are fighting inside the same fighting that you create outside there is no harmony in the family harmony in the society harmony in the culture harmony all these things if anybody who has to give this message we are supposed to give that and yoga can give that therefore my idea of international day of yoga it is not just only taking few asana let be let that be physical asana be beginning let there be starting of the classes and all those things but soon let us go to deeper levels let's start with yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara all these things we take it forward to see that the spirituality is different from religion in fact spirituality has come from several thousands of years ago that's what is you know it's like this deep inside our spirit is what is supposed to be blissful nature children by nature they are blissful 
By nature, they are blissful because they are natural. That's why look at the child, smiles, looking at your face. There's no reason for that. Reason is not yet born. Three, four days old child, you go and see the child, smiles. Can't ask the question, why you are smiling? Huh? Adults might be able to be careful. I don't ask the question, why is somebody smiling at you? you know? <laughs> With our children, that's not necessarily natural like that. So, at one spectrum, at one end of the spectrum is physical body, other end of the spectrum is bliss, consciousness. The children are blissful. They are not identified with the body level. They don't come to the body level unless until that's absolutely necessary. That's what is a spiritual well-being. Children are naturally spiritual. That's why <coughs> they are identified with the bliss, happy, run happily, walk happily, they enjoy crying also. <laughs> Happy. They are happy all the time. You know, when our center was very small, now it is very big actually. Now there are 1000 people staying in the campus. Earlier there were about 200 people were there at that time. The dining hall was there and then my house was there and in between there was a playground. And then all the children were playing. Seven, eight, nine year old children were playing. I finished my lunch and then I was walking to my place. I saw the children playing and naturally, you know, enjoy the children playing. My attention went to our cook's son and he had a cut on his knee, blood was coming out and he is continuing to play happy along with everybody. Immediate instinct is let me go and stop him and say, hey, you know, you are hurt, you are injured. But then next moment I thought, he is happy again. Okay. Why should I come in the way of happiness? Only thing is, let me watch, wait there, watch to see that he doesn't hurt on this, hurt one more time, and then I can attend to him. About half an hour I was watching, half an hour he was playing, and children were crying, yelling, joyful, and all that. But meanwhile, his mother finished her work in the kitchen, she came out. And you know what happens? The moment mother looks at the child, looked at her own child, saw the cut on the knee, Ooh, immediately she became so nervous. She shouted, hey, stop, come here. Because you are hurt, you are injured. <clears throat> and then boy from there, he shouts at the mom, mom, don't disturb me, I'm playing. But you know, she is a strong lady. She came on his way, stopped him, held him tight, showed him his knee, and look at the knee, blood is coming up. He looked at the knee. Then he came to the Anamai Kosha level, body level I didn't care. And said, ah. I can't walk, lift me up. And half an hour he has been playing. Nothing happened. No, I can't even walk, lift me. And you know, eight, nine year old boy, how can mother lift him? <laughs> Children are always at the Anam Anandamaya level, blissful state. They are never identified with the Anandamaya Kosha level. Anandamaya is the physical body, Bhautika personality. So, therefore, the more and more that you identify yourself with the body, the more and more you are materialist. And the more and more that you identify yourself with the blissful personality, you are the spiritual. So, the definition of spirituality is not that somebody has to have some marks and something, something, or you have to do only this <clears throat> kind of work, you have to get up only this type. These are not the things. The more and more that you identify yourself with the bliss, use the body when it is necessary. Yeah, you come to the body. Food is necessary for the body. Shelter is necessary for the body. Some transport, something like that. I come to the body level when it is necessary. Take care of it. But otherwise, I am identified myself with the bliss. I identified myself with the bliss. Whatever may be happening at the body level. Yeah, body has its own dharma. It follows that. So this is what is the difference between the materialist and the spiritualist. This is what is the idea. And Unfortunately, what happened is every human being is a spectrum of this high group in personality level. It's up to us whether we identify with the body or we identify with somewhere in between some idea saying ideology, some, some preconceived notions and get caught up in that or can we obviously bless one. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Ramana Maharshi, these are all our examples. Buddha, they were never at the body level. They identified themselves with the bliss. Ramana Maharshi was sitting under the tree, blissfully, 
and then he had a abscess on his shoulder. I said, I said something is there. He was laughing and but Swamiji, are you not hurt? Uh, it is doing its job, I'm doing my job. He is not at the body level. But then the doctor came and said, no, no, no. We have to do the surgery, take out all those things. He said, you know what? Why do you worry about it? I'm not worried about it. No, no, Swamiji, we have to remove that. Okay, you do the surgery, what you want to do the body. Then the doctor wanted to give him anesthesia. He said, what is it? He said, you know, you don't feel pain. That's why we give this anesthesia. That's all. Tell me not to feel pain. <laughs> I'm blissful. You do the thing. So he did that. Yet. After the surgery, oh, okay, you have done it. Okay, he moved all those things. Yeah, fine. And he continued. Every day the doctor would come and do the dressing to the surgery. After two, three days, he thought this man seemed to be thick skinned. He doesn't feel any pain. So the doctor started handling it. Hey, don't handle it. You know, tell me that you are doing something so that I can withdraw from that. That means so consciously can identify himself with the bliss, not identify with the body. This is what is basically what is the hypnosis? What is the synesthesia that you are given? Is it not something to take away your attention from the body level? And if you can do it consciously, that's what is spirituality. If some external agent does that, that's what we call it as anesthesia. That's what we call it as hypnosis. Whereas if you consciously manage it, that's what is basically yoga. Raman Ramakrishna Paramahamsa also is like that. He had throat cancer. It was such a big wound. And the doctor would come and say, Thakur, you should not speak because speaking aggravates all this thing. What can I do when people come and they talk? And then for the next two hours, the doctor is talking to him. <laughs> Suddenly, the doctor realized, oh, I myself am talking to you. He said, yeah, as long as this body is able to talk, continue to talk, what is there? And the day when it goes, I go away. So these are the people, extraordinary examples to show that we have these yogis. Another great yogi who showed that kind of a control over himself was Ramtirtha. Much, much less known. And he was also into the Ganga to take bath. And then suddenly his friends were there outside. He said, a crocodile caught him. He said, oh, crocodile caught him. They were all panicked. He said, don't worry about it. I think crocodile is winning. I'm going. So he just said, I'm going. Bhagavan Kata and went away. Finish. So, Yogi Nante Tanucha Chan. That means to say, Yogi is somebody before the prana leaves the body. He leaves the attachment from the body level. That's why he is called a spiritual. So that is all. Let us try to see that. In a world where more and more people are attached to the body, attached to the physical world outside, and all the amenities, specialties, blah, 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 all kinds of things provided the body level. With all those things, what am I going to achieve? What am I going to achieve? So is it not for us to see that? Why we are in this body? We are able to free ourselves from this body level attachment and free ourselves, become one blissful inside. Not only we are blissful, which is supposed to be the nature of consciousness, which is supposed to be the harmony, we can spread that harmony to the world around. Therefore, when in that International Day of Yoga, it is health, it is health at the spiritual level, is what is called as spiritual well being. That's what is the inner harmony. That's why harmony health. That's what is the thing that we require today in this world. So peace, health and harmony. Let us try to establish that. That's why we just take yoga as a spiritual value. Thank you. In fact, you know, we should be really, really fortunate because we are the cultural ambassadors, as Swam, as Modiji uh, said, and he brought this tool of yoga as International Day of Yoga, and in the whole world, I mean, you and know. Now, it is like giving a boost to us. In fact, you know, when somebody said, "My people were so happy when Tenzing Nake or 
at Mount Hillary went down to the Everest. Similarly, when Yuri Gagarin walked on the sky, or when somebody like, you know, he walked on the moon, what is that mankind has happened? Does that man felt, I said, when Hillary, when Edmund Hillary, uh, uh, <clears throat> people can go on to the Everest, human beings can go on to the Everest. That means we can go to the Everest. That means we are happy because one of us went to that. Similarly, and Modi gave us the idea of yoga, which we feel that so identified with our culture. You see, what a wonderful thing. In fact, after this, I see that any Indian face anywhere in the world, any airport that you sit out, the moment anybody looks at you, oh, wow, you're from India, yoga. Immediately, our people will say, yeah, you know, my grandfather used to practice yoga. <laughs> hey, but what are you doing? <laughs> Let us take this part. Let's not wait for being that. That's what we're going to take. We should be proud of that. Thank you. Yeah. That's a common householder. Yeah. And also interested in so many things. When you're really doing, and I've been. Uh, doing yoga, teaching, learning, also. At some point of time, your concentration or your focus gets diluted or it gets uh, disturbed. To bring it back, you try a lot of effort, take effort to bring it back. But it's only for a few uh, minutes or less time. Yeah. So, how do you come back to that level after two or three days or you practice? Actually, can be made better. it's not just only the practice of asana, pranayama, and meditation, all that. But in our culture, every aspect is yoga. Like, you know, people chant every morning Vishnu Sasana, Lanta Sasana, or chant Bhagavad Gita. These are all actually part of yoga. Now, believe it or not, in Turkey, in our teacher training program, Bhagavad Gita is a regular text that they have to chant. See, we have such an extraordinary, wonderful way that yoga permeated into our culture that is so many different ways. If you are regularly chanting, say, playing with Vishnu, Islam, and then chanting along with that, you see that your concentration, your one-pointedness, your focusing, all those things naturally improve. These are all indirect ways of helping those things. And uh, this, this culture has given Extraordinary, extraordinary degree of practices for us. But I don't have time to talk about Sanskrit. But, you know, scientifically, when you explain about the Sanskrit, it is, everything is so logical in Sanskrit that just learning Sanskrit or chanting Sanskrit will make so many things happen in our system. I don't want to go more than that because, you know, so many things that are there. Who's we there? are from, from Ireland. A group of people came to our center, Prashanti, 25, 25, 30 of them. They're all Sanskrit learning Sanskrit. I said they are from England, Ireland, so therefore let's talk in science. In, in English, you say uh, it's more difficult to talk in English than let's talk in Sanskrit. Oh. See, because they themselves, among them, they converse only in Sanskrit. They said that's easier to uh, talk in Sanskrit than in English. English, their mother tongue, something like that. You explain very beautifully some doubts in our mind and get for you. One small question um, How to motivate our children and students coming to America from appreciating and practicing whatever you say? Because they are living in a highly competitive world with deadlines, tensions, stress. So they look upon you as a stress reliever, physical exercise, or uh, alternative medicine. Not the way you explain. What do you say? That's the way of motivating and yeah. In fact, that's the best way of motivating. What you said is right. 
please keep practice of yoga, some chanting, something in your day-to-day -day life. You see, you know, as I said, just chanting and all that, it doesn't interfere with your daily activity. See, like for example, you're driving the car. Chanting is going on in your car. <laughs> Rather than listening to some nonsense, let this chanting go on. And then you listen to it. You see that how much it helps. Similarly, yoga practice. Once a week you do practice for your stress relief. And then somewhere you enter into, and then later on it will pick it up. They see the benefits of this. I tell you that how much that this particular consciousness has come about, not only in our culture, various cultures. A friend of mine in Romania, uh, Romanian doshes the <coughs> Iron Curtain, that means nothing culture they have to bring about, they can bring about. And uh, in, you know, two examples, let me quote from that. It's absolutely 100% Romanian. And somewhere he came across in some, there's some library, some yoga, small little booklet. How it came to that, in a small place called Cluj, Nepoca. And then he picked up that yoga book, there are posters. Then, because that he was afraid of the government, therefore, closed the whole thing, switched off lights in the dark room. He was practicing yoga posters. The practice. He practiced for 15 days. I don't know how somebody has noticed all those things. Slipped a small little two, three page leaflet under his door. It's about Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Who slipped it? Nobody knows. How it went? Nobody knows. And after that, another one month later, somebody slipped a vegetarian in his gym. Then he started really practicing vegetarian. Then immediately people became suspicious. You know, how it enters into them. This is one thing. Similarly, in Turkey, one young girl, 22, 23 year old girl, she went with an accident. And she had a back set. She, she went with a back pain. And then the doctor said, you have to go through surgery. Mm -hmm. Surgery means immediately people pick up back out. And then she said, is there any other way? Physiotherapy did not help her. Then she came across from somewhere. Yoga can help her. It's in Turkey, a Muslim girl. And then she started doing yoga. And then there in that yoga center, that they had a Bhagavad Gita book. And then, you know, anywhere in yoga center, Nataraja Vigraha is one thing. And then Bhagavad Gita book is there. And then some, you know, the Tibetan gong is there. These are all the things which are like a um, display. And then she looked at the Bhagavad Gita, opened that. Asked, what is this book? Is that it's supposed to be a yoga book? I have never opened it. And she opened that book, fascinated. Believe it or not, one year she took off from the work, sat down, translated Bhagavad Gita into Turkish language. And then now that book has become popular in Turkey. And she, in the process, see, that means to say how her back pain she started yoga and slowly it entered into Bhagavad Gita. Now, he runs a big center there, all that happened. So stress management or something like that, it gives something support to that, slowly it will help. Definitely people will catch it. Now, today, it's not difficult at all because anywhere that you come across this, you guys there and things happen. It's not difficult. And please visit our center. Actually, you know, I might have told all these things, but you will not believe unless you visit our center, see what is the amount of work that's going on. Day and night, people are doing the research work. Every nerve system, whatever that response that is there, when somebody does Shishasana, when somebody does Sabandasana, when somebody does Kapalbhati, everything is mapped there. Both physiological, psychological, neurological, all areas that we have studied now, actually genetic level that we are doing the research, how gene code can be changed with the help of yoga. It's an enormous amount of research is going on. There's a lot of epigenetic. Yeah, yeah. epigenetic philosophy. So that's, that's that's right. that's that's right. Right. In fact, you know how the simple in Germany hospital that we have done, one of my friends who is a doctor, she says that he did that by doing this particular yoga, amygdala expands, and amygdala is the place which has all this compassion and then self-confidence. All these things are in the part of brain called amygdala. 
that says that 20 to 30 percent of growth in amygdala is formed in three months of practice of yoga. And that research report is present, published in the International Journal. This is a wonderful research that's going on. That's why I said that there must have been one person who did the study how to stop heart with the help of yoga. But we have seen how you can create heart activity with the help of yoga. Hundreds of such papers are there. You can do that. Any more questions? If not, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Raghuram for the wonderful talk.